and we're going to be thinking together about walking and talking with the Lord and following in his steps today. Following Jesus, that's the message today. We call ourselves, I like the term, uh, you know, Christian, the word Christian now, especially throughout the world, unfortunately, uh, doesn't really convey who we are a lot of times. I mean, there's a lot of people who are Christians in name only. I like the term Christ followers. We're, we're, we're following Christ, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. What, what does it mean? Uh, what, what do we mean by following in the steps of Jesus? Well, you know, in, in uh, 1896, a man by the name of Charles uh, Sheldon wrote a book called In His Steps. And that's where the, you know, the little acronym WWJD, uh, that campaign came from, What Would Jesus Do? It came from that book um, what, written back then. Uh, it, it's from, from the 21st verse that I read, and I would like for us to uh, say together those last three words. So follow in your Bible there in uh, uh, Philipp, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, and those last three, three words, when we get to those, follow his steps. Let's all say that together, so follow along with me. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says, For, for to this you were called... Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Follow his steps. Uh, it says, who committed no sin nor was deep deceit found in his mouth. Uh, Jesus gave us the example. And so we're going to discover this morning, if we don't already know, I think most of us know it, the importance of submission to the Lord and submission as it relates into our work relationships. Um, and when we suffer, uh, he, he tells us here, when, we, when we, we suffer wrong in our work relationships, he says we're to, we're to remember the Savior. Jesus suffered. And as a follower of Jesus, I, I, I'm, I'm, we don't like to think about it, but uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, Paul said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. We, we will. Um, and after Thanksgiving, we're going to grapple with how submission works itself out in, in marriage, in the marriage relationship. And we'll learn that spouses are to serve one another. And we'll be uh, looking at that. Uh, but, but really, the, the overarching thing is, unless you submit to the Savior, you will struggle with this whole part of the Word of God here, this section of 1 Peter. No matter what situation we're in, we are to respond in a submissive attitude. We don't like to hear that, but that's what the Scripture says. Uh, let's, let's all say that together, submissive attitude. Submissive at we need to have a submissive attitude. Uh, last time we looked at the, you know, our, our relationship to the government, but, but what, is, what, what, does, what is submission? Well, let me give you a helpful definition. The word submit or to be, be submissive is to rank yourself under someone else in order to lift them up and build them up. That's really what the word, that's what it's talking about here. We're, we're, we're ranking ourselves under so that we can, we can lift up and, they, and we can build up. You know, the culture into which Peter was writing this letter when God inspired him, uh, there was a, uh, slavery was, was the norm. As a matter of fact, they, history tells us uh, that slavery was very common in the Roman Empire. Uh, one out of three, a third of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Now, not slaves in the normal way of, of thinking uh, think, that we think about. There were four main types of slaves in the Roman Empire. There were those who served, worked hard in the mines, minding the precious uh, ore and, and, and minerals. There were, there were slaves that, that worked there. There were other slaves that worked on the farms. Uh, thirdly, there were slaves that worked in the cities. And then there were slaves that worked in homes. And Peter here, when he uses this word servant, that first word there, servants, he's asked, that word there literally is the word for a household slave. He's saying household slaves. <laughs> That's literally the word here. You say, well, how do we apply that in our day here in 2020? Um, well, before we get into that, let me just say this. 
the horrible degradation of slavery in our own country was wrong. If you haven't come to that conclusion, it was wrong. Now I went back into history and I, my, my family, and I don't, it's not a proud thing, but it looks like that some of my ancestors owned slaves. It was the norm back, you know, 100, what, 150 years ago, more. But that it was not, it was wrong, you know. And, and, and I would say today, any kind of racism that's in our hearts or in churches or in our communities or in our country is wrong. Racism is wrong, folks. I know I'm not going to get a whole lot of amens on that, but that is true. I mean, racism is wrong. Whether, whether it's uh, white to black or black to white or, or a, uh, I tell you, living in Korea, uh, the Koreans, especially the older Korean people, they hate, literally, they, they, they hate Japanese. I mean, they do. They hate the Japanese people. They still do because of the, they remember all the terrible things that they did. That they made them slaves. They tried to do away with the Korean language. The Japanese took over and they tried to get rid of their, their own language. They were slaves. They took their, their women away as sex slaves. Um, slavery is an awful thing. But let's get the context here. Um, slaves in the Roman Empire were generally treated very well. Some of them were even managers. Some of them were highly educated. They were, they, they, they were trained professionals. Many of the slaves in the Roman were trained professional people. And they were normally paid some for their services. And uh, they had the protection of, of Roman law. Nevertheless, of course, they were held under, against their will, and so they were, they were slaves in that sense. We, we, actually, what, what we, we need is a, a stronger word here than servant, but a weaker word than what we normally think of in our minds of slave, because that's, that's who he's talking, that's who he's, he's addressing here. And so I think the application, uh, it would be like a, a semi-permanent semi um, employee without legal and economic freedom. That, that's, that's what he was talking about. But in our day to day, the new, you know, the, new, the new Testament does not endorse slavery, and yet I tried to look at it. It doesn't necessarily for, forbid it, but it doesn't endorse it. And we know, don't we, through history that, that all the seeds for the dissolution of slavery are, are, are sown here in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. And when slavery was done away with in England, when slavery was done away here in our own country, uh, the big people who were the leaders and the most vocal were mostly Christians, or and some of them preachers and leaders. So we don't want to forget that. But slavery itself, you know, Christianity did not abolish slavery, but it did introduce a new relationship of brotherhood and dignity for every person that eventually uh, led to the transformation of our society and so now uh, but folks slavery is still with us any of you heard about human trafficking i mean it's right here in the mid-south uh bro brother Whalen, i mean it's right this i-40 cor corridor children are being targeted I mean, we still have slavery today. Well, I mean, it's, it's illegal, <laughs> praise God, and that's it's wrong. Slavery's not, it's, but we still have it. And it should burden our hearts today. But the Bible gives us a good, Philemon, in Philemon verse 16, when Paul um, spoke to a, a slave owner named Philemon, that, that was his name, he said, he told him to receive his runaway slave back. He says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, because uh, Onesimus had trusted the Lord, had come to know the Lord. Uh, Galatians 3.28, I think I have that one up there. Uh, David, I'm not sure if I sent that one to you, but uh, Galatians 3.28 speaks of that. Um, you know, we can apply this passage, I think our, our, the real application is to our workplace, to the employee-employer relationship. Or sometimes, you know, sometimes employees feel like the company that they work for uh, kind of... Uh, what do you want to say? Owns them, <laughs> or kind of dict. Well, that's. But you know, it's different here in America. 
Um, thank God. We, we can appeal, and in, in some cases we can you know, use what they call what, collective uh, bargaining. We have an own, uh, you know, OSHA protects uh, employees that work for people here in our country, and, and their people are legally covered from harassment and from job discrimination and all that. But, you know, bottom line is if it gets too bad, you can, you can just quit your job and find another one, usually. I know it's kind of tough right now. but. Um, and, and I'm not trying to put, you know, some folks, and maybe even some of you who are still working, are, are in a tough working environment. So I don't want to minimize this morning or to trivialize that, that some people uh, may feel trapped or they don't like their job. Or maybe in some cases, Brother Dave, they might be being taken advantage of. Um, but I do believe the Bible has something to say about it. And I, I want to suggest that there's at least uh, five principles or exhortations for those of us who work. The first one is, we are called by God as His followers, Christ's followers, to live out your position as a servant. Notice what He says here. Again, servants, be submissive to your masters uh, with all reverence is actually the word there. Not only... Uh, to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh, for this is commendable if because, notice, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten or you suffer for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, that is commendable to God. Now what's he saying? Well, first of all, of course, he's saying that employers need to be careful to not treat people as property. But he's saying here that as Christ followers, if we're working for someone, we must exhibit a Christ-like quality in, in trying to follow. Christ followers, remember I said last Sunday, ought to be the best citizens? Well, I think what he's saying here is today, we should be the best employees too. We should be the best employees. We, we, should, we should exemplify Christ. Even sometimes if we're wronged, even if we suffer. That's what he's saying here. Uh, Colossians 3.17 uh, speaks to that. It says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So whatever you do, do all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're His follower. But how do you, how do you live out? How do you live out your position as a servant? Well, first of all, notice he says we're to respect our boss. Uh, you, you, you need to have respect toward... Your boss have a healthy desire to show uh, deference and respect. And of course, sometimes it's not easy to do, is it? <laughs> Depending on what kind of boss you got. You know, some of us have good bosses. Some of us have, uh, you know, kind of. Pardon the pun, slave drivers. But uh, <laughs> but we're to exemplify. We're to we're, we're to have respect toward our boss. And then he he goes even further, folks. That this is tough. We're to endure faithfully even when it's not fair. That's what he says here in verse 18. Um, you, you, you know, we've all heard it said that no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and that's true sometimes. Uh, it's much e easier, of course, to serve a kind and gentle boss, but it's difficult when he or she is um, harsh. And, but he says here, even if he said, serve the one, have respect to those that are gentle, but he said, respect who's ever over you, whoever you. Even if they're harsh, you're supposed to, to respect. It's interesting, uh, the word harsh here is literally, uh, you've heard of scoliosis, you know, crooked. That's the, that's the Greek word here, it's crooked. <laughs> even you got a crooked boss, even you got a corrupt boss. The Bible says if you're a Christ follower, you're supposed to have some kind of healthy respect for them. But thirdly, I think this is the crux. If we're to live out our position as servants in the world, we're to see God as our ultimate boss. Let's, let's all say that. See God as, our, as your ultimate boss. Let's say that. See God as your ultimate. Our ultimate boss is the Lord, Jesus Christ. We, we call him the Lord. That means he's our boss. He is our, God is our ultimate boss. Notice he says in verse 19, uh, For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief. Conscience toward God. You see, we're called to endure sometimes grief, even suffering wrongly. But when we do that, it says here that we receive God's favor. 
God's favor, God's approval is extended to us. Of course, when we're sick sometimes, when we're sick and when we're suffering, and then I was praying with Miss D, uh, D this week, Miss D, D, when we're sad, uh, that's when God, even though it's tough, maybe more so I think we experience God's favor and God's mercy and God's grace. That's what Miss D was, D, D was telling me. She said initially it was, it was just crushing, but she said now, she said, I'm, I'm sensing God's mercy and God's grace in the midst of of all of this. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to stay on track in the workplace, those of you who are still working, let me just say today, is, is to recognize that ultimately God is your employer. God, God's your boss. God's your employer. You know, I just heard a story recently about a, a guy, he was, on a, he was on an airplane and it was delayed on the ground and the passengers became upset and impatient and one obnoxious guy took it out, took his frustration out on the flight attendant lady there and was just letting her have it. And uh, she just smiled and was kind and, and courteous. And uh, when the plane finally took off, someone asked this uh, flight attendant to come over and said, you know, uh, can you give me your name because I, I want to write a letter of commendation to your employer. And the man was surprised and shocked when the girl looked at him and said, thank you, sir, but she said, I don't work for American Airlines. I work for my Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's who's your boss, folks. You may have an earthly boss, but if you're a Christ follower, I'll tell you, your boss is Jesus. Your boss is the Lord. Remember that. That'll, that'll keep you focused here. And that explains how this lady was able to handle this mis mistreatment from a, a passenger. So the, the key is to be mindful of who your master is. He says, servants, be submissive to your master. Our ultimate master is the Lord. And then he tells us to how do we live it out? Pers persevere patiently so that we can please God. We're, we're trying to please God. The primary reason for submitting, for submission, is to please God. You see, our, our attitude impacts others. Our, our attitude will impact our workplace. Why, we don't always know in advance how much we're going to be misunderstood or maybe how much we may have to suffer some, but we do know that if we are serious about following the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Him wholeheartedly, um, as I said, we're going to face we're going to face trouble. That, Philippians one twenty nine is the verse I quoted earlier. I got it ahead of myself, but uh, it says, "All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." So, if you're serious, if you are serious this morning about serving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then get ready. You're probably going to suffer some, because it says Jesus left an example, and did Jesus suffer? Oh, did he suffer? And so that's what God is telling us today. Ministry is often a struggle, but it's worth it. And this morning, if you're feeling yourself wanting to pull back and find yourself wondering about your work and about the ministry that God... You know, by the way, your work is your ministry, folks. If you're working somewhere, I know that's how you make your living, but it's, it's really a ministry, too. Because ultimately... Your boss is the Lord and you're serving Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, I think will we'll encourage you today. What does he say? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your work, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we're to live it out. Live out that submission. But secondly, we're to follow Jesus as a pattern. Notice verse 21, he says that Jesus... Are you aware that as a Christ follower, you're called to suffer? We're to follow this pattern. You know, when, when, I, when I get all up in wanting to be right and, and demanding my rights and feeling all self-righteous when I've been wronged, does that really help anything? <laughs> it usually doesn't. It makes it worse. <laughs> it's been my experience. Diedrich Bonhoeffer who was martyred for his faith in Nazi Germany. This is one of his quotes from one of his books. Listen to what he said. 
When Christ calls a man or a person, he bids him come and die. He bids him come and die. Die to yourself. Jesus talked about it. He said, you know, we're to, be, we're to die to ourselves. We're to live an unselfish life. We're called to follow in his steps. Jesus has left us a transcript of his life here in the Bible and that we're to, we're to trace it. We're to set, uh, there's a set of spiritual ABCs for us to copy. Uh, listen to 1 John 2, 6. I think I have that one up there. For, listen. Jesus said this. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How did what Jesus walk? He obeyed the Lord, and he suffered for it. And if we obey the Lord, there is going to be. I'm not saying you need a martyr complex or a suffer, but it's just going to happen. If you follow the Lord, uh, it's, it's going to happen. And I think as we move into the new climate here in our country, uh, there will be a plenty of room for us to be, uh, to be persecuted if we stand up for the Lord. But we're not, don't act sinfully. Jesus committed, it says he, what? It says, he who committed no sin. You know, we're to strive not to do wrong, not to sin. That doesn't mean we're always going to be successful, <laughs> but we ought to be striving that way and because Jesus is our example. And, and we're to don't speak sinfully. Well, this is a tough one. I'll have to admit it. It's tough for me. It's tough for most of us. Make sure your lips match up with your life. Guard what comes out of your mouth. It says here, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Proverbs 13, 3 says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. <laughs> zip it sometimes. Sometimes we just have to zip it, folks. And don't retaliate. We're not to speak sinfully, we're to, we're, but we're not to retaliate. Jesus, it says, when he was reviled, what did he do? He didn't return it. Matter of fact, he said, when somebody slaps you on one side, turn the other side and let them hit you on the other. That, that's, that's not easy. That's, that's tough. But that was our Lord. We're to trust God to make the wrongs right. And it may not happen in this time, but it will be, ultimately. God, uh, just as Jesus, it said, committed himself to who? The ultimate judge. Jesus committed himself to the Father, to the ultimate judge. So, too, we must rely on God to handle justice. Um, yeah, we can cry out for justice, and we need to... We did, that's a big movement today, but I'll tell you, uh, it's not going to happen. Ho hopefully, most of the time, we get justice. But it's, on this earth, this, this fallen world, that we, we're not always going to get justice. But I guarantee you, in the, in the end, God's going to make all the wrong right. That's why we pray, even so come, Lord Jesus, because we know when he comes back, he's going to be the righteous judge, and he's going to make it all, all that right stuff. L listen to Romans, I think I put it up, Romans 12. Paul is speaking in Romans 12, verses 19, 20. He says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance, what does God say? Vengeance is mine, God said. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If, you're, if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. So follow Jesus' pattern. The third thing that we're told here is to allow Jesus to, to deliver you from the penalty of sin. All of us are sinners, but thank God, verse 24 says, For he, Jesus himself, for, for who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live to righteousness. He delivered us from the penalty of sin. All of us had the penalty of death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. Separation from God. We had that penalty on us. But Jesus bore those sins, Brother David. Hallelujah. Amen. He bore all of our sins. Every sin you've ever committed. Every sin I've ever committed or ever will commit. Every sin that Mao Zedong did. Every sin that Adolf, Adolf Hitler did. Jesus took all of that sin. And it says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He took it all. Allow him to deliver you from the penalty of sin if you haven't done that. The Father counted our sins against Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 6 uh, basically says that. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, what, has laid on him, laid on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Yes, never forget that Jesus took your curse. Jesus, your Savior, took your curse. And the condemnation that was rightfully ours, he bore that on himself, on the cross. But a fourth thing we're told here is to trust Jesus not only to deliver us from the penalty of sin, but to give us power to serve him. Notice what he says in verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we having died to sins might what? Live uh, for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. In other words, not only have we been freed from the penalty of sin that was resting on us, which was eternal separation from God, we've also been given the power to live, to serve the Lord. You know the word servant here is used 1,000 times in the Bible. If you read your Bible all the way through, 1,000 times you will see that word servant. Servant. When, when Paul and James and Peter and Jude... When they wrote their letters, if you'll pick up those letters, when you start reading those letters in the New Testament, all, every time, how do they introduce themselves? The first thing that they did was, I'm a servant. It's actually that same word here. It's that word doulos. It's literally the word slave. They said, I'm a slave of Jesus. That's who I am. That's how they end. You see, this is their fundamental identity, and it should be ours as well. We've, we've been set free from sin in order to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. But the final thing we learn here is, and, and this is where it all, all comes together. It all comes together. So if you hadn't been with me, join up right now, because it's going to come all together. Here it is. What's the fifth thing that we learn here? Our purpose is to stay close to Jesus. Let's say that together. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. That's, that's your purpose. If you're a Christ follower, <laughs> stick with st Stay close to Jesus. Of course, he's not ever going to leave you. The problem is <laughs> we move away from him, right? Stay close to Jesus. That's what he's saying here. L listen to what he, how he finishes up this, this passage. This is wonderful. He says, For you were, you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Folks, when the Bible says that we're like sheep, <laughs> that's not a compliment. <laughs> what, what, is, what is the tendency of sheep? It's to wander. I mean, you, you, you get a bunch of sheep out in the field and, and, and they're, look, they're only thinking about themselves. They're thinking about filling their tummies and, and you know, they'll wander. Over, and the next thing you know, what? you see, when the Bible calls us sheep, that's not a compliment, <laughs> Brother David. <laughs> uh, left to ourselves, left to ourselves, we will go astray by going our own way. Let me ask you, have you been going astray? You know, I love it says here that Jesus is our shepherd. But it also says he's not only our shepherd, he's our overseer. He's looking over us. He's our shepherd, Brother Randy, but he's our overseer. He's overseeing us. The shepherd is the one that provides. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd that lays, he cares for his sheep. But he's not, Jesus is not only our shepherd, he's also the guardian. He's our guardian, he's our over, he protects us. In the, in the Greek, in the ancient world, Greek world, the overseer was the one who, who came unannounced to the troops to see if they were prepared for the battle. And Jesus is coming today as our overseer. He said, are you, are you ready? We're, we're going to leave here in just a few minutes. And we're going to go back out there. And I hope you see that sign when you go out and look to the right. What does it say? You're now entering the mission field. <laughs> are you ready? That's what worship ought to do. It ought to make us ready to get back out 
into the battle. Our overseer watches out for us. Jesus is not just my example, but he's also the one that gives me the power and provides for me and protects me. And so since the Bible gives us the answers we need to live this life the Lord's way, we really shouldn't say, what would Jesus do? We could say this morning, what did Jesus do? <laughs> what did Jesus do? He died in your place and my place. He took your condemnation, my condemnation. He took the curse that was ours. Now, Sheldon, who, who wrote the author, he was the author of In His Steps. He was really the forerunner, forerunner of what is known today as the social gospel movement. And there's, there's not much in his book about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. But, you know, as followers of Christ, our role is not to reform society. We can't. We can't. What is our role, Brother David? It's to share the gospel that saves souls. And when people come to know the Lord, society will be reformed, uh, transformed. You see, when those saved souls live out the gospel, that's what brings change. We cannot, reform, we cannot reform our society. That's not our goal. Our goal is to share the gospel. And when, the, when people believe the gospel and are changed by the work of the Holy Spirit, then they will change uh, the world. And so I come with the final little acronym, and it's WWID. Not WWJD, WW, what will I do? What will I do? Jesus paid for your salvation, but you and I must submit, we must surrender, we must be saved. And then once we're saved, we're to serve. And then sometimes it means we're going to suffer. And you know a servant serves no matter what. A servant serves because he's committed Someone said it well. The servant does what he's told when he's told to do it. That's what we're supposed to do. You see, the volunteer does what he or she wants to do when they feel like doing it. That's, no, we're not volunteers. We're servants. We're to serve the Lord. So the question as we close out this morning is, what will I do? What will you do? Now, most of you, there should be one of these close by you. It's a little blue card that we handed out sometime last year, but I, I want you to pick one up. If you didn't get one, there's some extra ones here. Our uh, nominating committee is about to be activated as we think about uh, 2021. And I want you to take one of these cards. Not everything's on here, but it does, you know, put your, you put your name and whatever. And then there's a few little boxes, but then probably the big box is the one that says other. I want you to take one of these cards, take it home, pray about it, and then bring it back next Sunday. Put it in the offering box. It will help our nominee. So, you know, you ask Brother Sam, what, what will I do? This is what I'll do. This is what the Lord is leading me to do this year. I know we don't have our Sunday school back, but we're going to figure out a way to do that soon. Uh, one of the things I really want us to do is, is strengthen our outreach ministry. I mean, doing church now and outreach now, it's, it's challenging. We've got to come up with some creative ways. And I need some, we need some help. I need some of us to say, Lord, I'd step up and say, Lord, I'm going to help my pastor figure out how we can reach out to more people, even in this COVID thing. Of course, the vaccine's on its way, they say and maybe things will get back somewhat to normal but but uh pray about it. there's so many prayer welcome team uh worship music team uh outreach you want to work with adults you want to work in the nursery or kids or students or missions and then there's a you know lord may there may be other things down there you can mark that and write that down but take this home and and pray about it and get bring it back and uh turn that in let's all stand we're going to sing a hymn of invitation as we close out our service today. I trust the Lord has spoken to you. We're going to sing softly and tenderly, uh, Jesus is calling. He is, and if you have not come to that place of submission where you've submitted your life to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, we invite you to do that. Uh,
uh, we won't have a public invocation like we normally do, but I'll be down here at the end of the service. You want to come forward if, if, if you need prayer, if you want to make a recommitment to the Lord or some other decision, become part of our fellowship. If the Lord is leading you to do that, whatever the Lord leads, we'll be here to receive you for that. But let's sing this uh, song as we.